Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, Mississippi farmers plan to plant more corn, cotton, and rice this year. The Food Factor is a well-oiled machine, but you don't see everything that's recorded. We'll have the bloopers from behind the scenes. In Southern Gardening, Gary gives us some ideas to make hanging baskets into color accents for your home. In the market, skyrocketing corn acreage puts prices in a holding pattern, as the feeder cattle trade may have to deal with more downside. In the feature segment today, Forge Day at Mississippi State's Crosby Arboretum in Picayune. It's a reminder of how iron work used to be done. I had one woman just tell me that it engaged her son for three hours and he had been complaining about coming and he thought it was going to be a dull and boring class. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. The 2016 Planning Intentions Report was released March 31st, and Mississippi farmers plan to plant more cotton and less beans. Leighton, the Planning Intentions Report shows a lot more corn and cotton in the nation in 2016. The report came out last week, but not in time for last week's Farm Week, so I'll have the numbers for you now, and Leighton will have analysis in the market segment. As we look at cotton in the United States, 9.35 million acres being predicted, up 11% from the previous year. Here in Mississippi, a big 41% increase from last year, possible 450,000 acres being planted. Soybeans, 82.24 million acres predicted. That's down 1% from the previous year. In fact, acreage was down in a lot of states. Here in Mississippi, it was down uh, 2 million acres being predicted. That's down 13% from the previous year. In terms of uh, U.S. corn planting intentions, 93.6 million acres. That's the highest since 2013, the third highest since 1944. That's up 6% from the previous year. Here in Mississippi, 800,000 acres being predicted. That's up 57%, but our weather may not let that happen. In terms of uh, rice in the U.S., 3.06 million acres predicted. That's up 17%. Here in Mississippi, up 47%. 220,000 acres being predicted here. So we look at U.S. winter wheat, 36.22 million acres have been planted. That's down 8% from the previous year. Here in Mississippi, our acreage is way down. Only 90,000 acres planted. That's down 40% from the previous year, about 30,000 acre decline. So we look at peanuts in the U.S., 1.48 million acres being predicted. That's down 8%. Here in Mississippi, we kind of track that. Uh, we're predicted to be down 9% with 40,000 acres. U.S. sweet potatoes, 169,400 acres being predicted. That's up, would be up 8% from last year. North Carolina, though, they're boosting their acreage 21%, and they are the big wheels when it comes to sweet potato production. Here in Mississippi, 25,000 acres are being predicted. Uh, that's down 7% from the previous year. U.S. grain sorghum, 7.22 million acres being predicted. That's down 15%. Here in Mississippi, only 50,000 acres is predicted. That's down 5% from the previous year. And as we look at Mississippi's estimated planted acreage, that's for the major principal row crops. 2016, looking for 3.67 million acres, and that's up about a percent and a half compared to the previous year. Over the past two years, the Food Factor has promoted leading a healthier lifestyle through diet and exercise. This week, however, we take a look back at some of the more lighthearted moments that have taken place during Food Factor production. As you know, we like to share nutritious tips, have fun, and of course, be healthy. Really? I hope you enjoy this special edition of Bloopers. Love is not there. Wait, I didn't walk in. I, I forgot where I was going. Regardless of how you choose to enjoy your sweet potato. <laughs> Say, go. <laughs> 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 
Let's just try it. Okay. Tasty addition to those soups and stews that you crave during the cold winter months that the top I cannot get off. <laughs> These winter vegetables make a tasty addition to those. <laughs> But did you know? Bad luck. <laughs> Healthy family meals are easier than. <laughs> Lacking flavor. <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> That's good. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. And here's some food for thought. Laughing 15 minutes per day can burn anywhere between 10 to 40 calories. Well, are you looking for a fast and easy splash of color? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with Mississippi State University says hanging baskets are a great way to add color accents to your home. I've always said that colorful hanging baskets are a great way to bring the summer landscape up close to the house. In my mind, you can't beat a hanging basket planted with super tunias and their 36 inch spread. They grow with mounded habits, are terrific spiller plants, and the medium to large flowers are outstanding. Probably my favorite combination is anything planted with the clear pink flowering Vista bubblegum. This basket also has white flowers of Vista Silverberry and Deep Pink Fuchsia. A combination that runs a close second is Honey and Royal Velvet Supertunias. The color contrast of the melange of orange and yellow warm sunset colors with the Fit for a Queen Velvety Purple is mesmerizing. For mixed color combination baskets, you can't beat the Mix Masters with combined plants having unique themes. A great fit is a wonderful full sun basket having sunspun lavender star petunia, Aztec violet verbena, and the red geranium thriller that fit perfectly together and will deliver nonstop flowering until fall. Sweet Escape is another full sun continuously flowering combination with sunspun yellow petunia, Aztec burgundy verbena, and cabaret light pink calabracoa that will carry you away. And one final groovy basket is Flower Child with sunspun burgundy petunia, Aztec white verbena, and hot spring sky blue lobelia definitely is a far out combination. Colorful hanging baskets are a must have for your landscape this year. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Like Gary says that if the basket is going to be located well above your eye level, you can use plants that are rounded or will trail over the edge. In the feature segment today, it's Forge Day at Mississippi State's Crosby Arboretum in Picayune. This annual day honors the art of working metal by hand. Time now for the markets with Layton, and uh, you've got some analysis of the acreage predictions. That's right, Artis, and uh, as DTN's headline put it that day, U.S. DA stuns markets, particularly corn, as we've talked about a little bit earlier. Also ahead in this segment, that same report may bring about a shift in perception as far as the wheat market. For livestock producers, the projections may actually take some of the volatility out of feed prices as the feeder cattle market deals with some sharp losses at midweek. The corn market is described as moving into a holding pattern following that March 31st prospective plantings report. Meanwhile, there wasn't much shock to the soybean figures, but more cotton is now projected to be planted as farmers feel less confident about returns from corn and soybeans. Extension economist Brian Williams touches on the implications for all these crops in this discussion. Well, Brian, let's begin with what was definitely the biggest surprise in this planning intentions report. Yeah, corn was, was definitely a big surprise uh, in terms of acreage. Um, based on the surveys that the USDA sent out in, in late February, early March, they're estimating about 93.6 million acres of corn uh, to be planted this summer, and that's a 6% increase 
uh, from last year, and that's way higher than what anybody expected. Um, in, here in Mississippi, we're expecting about 800,000 acres, which would be a 57% increase uh, compared to the 510,000 we had last year. Well, so far, what has the market reaction been, and uh, what does it look like the markets may do longer term in, as a result of these numbers? Well, the, the day the report came out, markets were down about 16 cents. Uh, since then, they've kind of leveled off. They've bounced back a little bit, but it looks like we may kind of enter that holding pattern again. Uh, it seems they've kind of adjusted to the report. All right, let's shift over to soybeans now. What, what did the numbers tell us as far as nationwide and also Mississippi? Well, uh, soybeans weren't near as, as big of a surprise. They were pretty close to what we were expecting. Uh, they came out with, with 82.236 uh, million acres of soybeans. Uh, that's down just slightly from a year ago. And then here in Mississippi, we're expected to have about 2 million acres, which is down from about 2.3 million we had last year. So one might guess prices went up on this news. What, what in fact has happened? They went up slightly, but there really wasn't too much of a reaction in the soybeans, mainly because it was, it was fairly close to what we were expecting. Just not the surprise that corn obviously was to all the analysts. Exactly. All right, what about uh, cotton? I understand a big increase for Mississippi and also an increase nationwide. Yeah, on uh, cotton we had a 41% increase in, in acreage in the, in the state of Mississippi, about 450,000 uh, acres. And then nationwide we had about an 11% increase, um, sitting at about 9.5 million acres. All right, how might you explain that? Because prices haven't exactly been an incentive for farmers, so to speak. Right, and, and prices have been lower uh, comparatively across the board. Um, but with cotton, uh, what we're looking at is price ratios and the pr uh, cotton to corn price ratio and the cotton to soybean price ratio were a lot more favorable than they were a year ago, particularly in December and January when the producers were making those decisions. Meanwhile, projected winter wheat acreage is down 8% in the U.S. compared to 2015, as you heard earlier, and also down 40% in Mississippi. Analyst Naomi Bloom thinks these and other wheat figures put this market in a much less negative light as far as the longer term. The global ending stocks are still very large, and that's going to be the more of the dominating factor for the market right now. But the fact that now the perception is shifting that there's going to be just a little bit less supplies in the United States. Now what if other nations um, around the world start to follow suit and just do just those little tidbits of less production? It's putting the brakes on the negativity. And so from that standpoint, I would think if you take it maybe a year or a year and a half out, we start to see maybe a longer term rounding bottom on the charts. Um, nothing that's going to make the market just rally from here, but I think the negative is in. And let's check out our trivia quiz for this week. It's about the dairy sector. How much more milk does the average dairy cow produce now compared to 2006, 10 years ago? Is the answer 4% more or 10% or 14% or as much as 20% more? Stay with us to find out the answer. We're going to pause for a short break on farm wheat. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span says livestock feed prices are expected to be more steady due to growing corn stocks. In the feature segment today, join us at Forge Day at Mississippi State University's Crosby Arboretum in Picayune. Once it took skill, patience, and strength to work iron into something beautiful. You know what, Daddy? I think these may be the best tomatoes we've ever grown. I think you're right. Hey, I bet we sell all of them before lunch. Man, look at that. Let me get four boxes. So, how was everything? Did you enjoy those stuffed tomatoes? It's delicious. Are these locally grown? Yep, I picked them up at the farmer's market this morning. Now, before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. The last beef cattle boot camp takes place Friday, April 15th. The location is the Coastal Research Unit of Mississippi State University. That's west of Newton. Practical bull selection, herd health, alternative feed sources, estate planning, and rotational grazing are some of the items on the agenda. The future of antibiotic use will be discussed as well. The boot camp registration fee is $35 in advance and $45 at the gate. Landowners waiting to 
wanting to earn supplemental income from their land should attend the Outdoor Business Workshop. It takes place Wednesday, May 4th. The location is the Lexington Multiplex on Depot Street in Lexington. The hours are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. You will be in the field, so wear appropriate clothing. Lunch will be served, so please call ahead. You'll tour a cattle operation that's earning supplemental income. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Moving into the livestock markets now, a positive spinoff is expected for this sector out of that perspective planning's report. The University of Missouri's Scott Brown says the projections could help take some of the volatility out of feed prices for livestock producers. Brown says that corn ending stocks are only going to grow and that he says is good news if you're a cattle hog or poultry producer and you need to buy feed. Well, speaking of cattle, there are a lot of feeders out there, and this sector of the cattle market saw a big break the last part of the month of March. Placement figures have been big, according to analyst Don Ruse, with a lot of feeders outside the feedlot coming off of wheat pasture right now. I think where we're at in the feeder cattle is we think it's one that probably is the best of the worst in the cattle that probably has uh, some support. But I would say, you know, another 3 to $5 down, you know, we'd probably see some buying interest. But the upside rallies, just as the cattle, uh, cash, uh, cattle in the uh, futures, we think are probably more risk management opportunities than anything else. Because remember, November feeders uh, took a shot down uh, under 140. Well, if a new survey by DTN and Progressive Farmer is any indication, morale is sinking right now in the agriculture sector. 500 crop and livestock producers filled out the confidence index the first 10 days of March. The overall index came out to be 91 and a half, indicating an increasing degree of pessimism, according to statisticians. An index of 100 is considered neutral, while anything below means increasing pessimism. DTN, in fact, says the bottom line of the latest confidence index is that farmers see little hope to improve their incomes this year. Back to trivia now as we wrap things up for this week in the markets. The correct answer is C. The average dairy cow produces 14% more milk today than 10 years ago as dairy farms have become more efficient. The craft of metal forging, which dates back as early as 4500 BC, is used for various artistic and functional purposes. Due to its versatility, metal can be used for jewelry, home decor, tools, heavy machinery, and more. Forge Day is held each year on the last Saturday of January at Mississippi State University Extension's Crosby Arboretum. It celebrates the art form of metal smithing and, is, and its contribution to the development of mankind. Visitors got an up-close look at metal forging and some even got to try it for themselves. Some of us who hear the term forging believe it means to copy, imitate, or deceive. But what you see at the annual Forge Day is far from fake. The event demonstrates metal smithing, which involves shaping metal to create an art piece or tool. Charles Polk says he enjoys practicing this fascinating skill, which he's learning at a young age. Usually I uh, railroad spike knives, um, S hooks, um, drive hooks, bottle openers, them kind of stuff. I like to do knives. They're, it's it's fun. It's a challenge, and you never know what you really what kind of shape or stuff you're gonna get out of it. I made uh, an 18-inch uh, buoy before, and it was it was pretty fun. Really, when the, the final part, it's when you take it out and you cool it off, and you got it in your hands, and you're like, man, I, I made that, and it's just neat, and it's worth it's worth your while. It's worth all the work. Polk was one of the many artisans at Forge Day who showed visitors how to shape metal using heat and pressure. Metal smithing is very similar to blacksmithing. The only difference is blacksmithing works with iron and steel, while metal smithing involves various different metals. He says the possibilities for creating a one-of-a-kind piece are endless. There's so many techniques. There's tapering, there's fullering. You can stretch it out, make it wider. It just it depends on 
what you're trying to make. It, it really does. And um, it's, it's not complicated. As soon as you get it, it's stuck. You ain't gonna just forget. It's something you'll, it's like riding a bike. The hardest thing I've probably ever done was uh, heat treating. Uh, you, when you stick it in that cold water, you never know uh, when, you, it's, when it's gonna crack or something, and then might as well just throw it away. When you're heat treating, it, it, it cools off fast, and it's just gonna snap if you just don't do it just right. Polk says many of the pieces he makes are for sale, and he also customizes items for individuals. For anyone interested in learning about metal or blacksmithing, clubs and organizations are available, like Mississippi Forge Council and Gulf Coast Blacksmith Association. I'm part of a Gulf Coast Blacksmith Association. And it's just a great place to go if you want to learn blacksmithing, and there's a whole bunch of older smiths who know just about everything. We have a, a quick business meeting, then people go out in the back and they have forges that's already lit, and you can just go back there, bring your tools, and forge what you want. In addition to organizations and artisans being present with items for sale, free knife sharpening was offered to those who brought dull knives to Forge Day. Pat Drackett, director of Crosby Arboretum, says the event was created in response to public interest. We had so many people who would stand around the blacksmith group at the Piney Woods Heritage Festival that we decided we would try to do a forge day in January when not much else is happening. We had a great attendance this year because we benefited from a Visit Mississippi uh, tourism development grant that allowed us to do advertising and we had probably three times the amount of people that we had last year. We had close to 500 people here today and reached, reached a, a large section of the public. So we just couldn't be more pleased. I had one woman just tell me that it engaged her son for three hours and he had been complaining about coming and he thought it was going to be a dull and boring class. So when we can see scout groups come in to work on their metalworking badges, and just the fun that people have here, this brings people out to the Arboretum that might not normally have visited. Drackett adds that metal forging is becoming a popular hobby for young people. It's wonderful to see people get captivated uh, and, and think of this might be something that they would like to, to pick up. Youth can participate, some of the forgers will allow them to participate, and we have waiver forms and provide safety equipment for, for them for that but he will start making these little little swords or a little hook. And when uh, someone makes something like that and can take it home, it's a real memento and a, of something that you've been able to craft yourself. Some of the forging equipment used at the event dates back to the 1850s, creating a salute to our own roots and heritage. Blacksmith Chuck Averett was on site making metal poppy flowers to honor a very important time in history. This poppy we're making today is going to go to Flanders, Belgium, where a lot of the fighting took place for four years there. And the, the designer of the project contacted blacksmiths from all around the world to put this thing together because World War I was the last place blacksmiths were used uh, in a, you know, a large extent of the workforce. So we're making these 2016 poppies for the year 2016, which is the 100 year anniversary of one of the major battles there. Uh, so your work today will go to Belgium. The reason they chose poppies was because this is a natural flower that grew there and even after all the shelling and bombing that took place, the poppies continued to come up. And this is what the soldiers remembered most when they came home, how pretty the poppies were. As most items today seem to be purchased predominantly in chain stores, metal forging is thought to be just something folks did in the old days. But Charles Polk says this time-honored art has a new lease on life. People say that uh, blacksmiths and the dying art, and it's not. There's so many people getting into this, and um, it's just amazing how many blacksmiths there really are. It's pretty fun and it's crazy to think, you know, somebody's done this a thousand years ago and you're just taking the generation. We're the new age of blacksmithing. In reflection, this year's Forge Day at the Crosby Arboretum offers a compelling take home message. As you watch the turning wheel of an old forge, it seems to symbolize an art form that's making a comeback full circle. From Picayune, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor Myers reporting.
You can watch the story again on Forge Day on our Farm Week website, our Facebook page or YouTube. Our website address is farmweek.msucares.com. The Crosby Arboretum of Mississippi State University Extension is located on Ridge Road at Picayune. Forge Day takes place annually on the last Saturday of January. Amy, uh, what about the quality of what they make versus what you can buy in a store today? Speaking of old versus new, the gentleman making the knives was making them out of actual metal chisels and he emphasized the importance of not going to the hardware store to get them because you have to use the old, old, old chisels because they're higher quality. The new ones at the hardware store will break if you try to make a knife out of it. Hmm. That's Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are at your farm week for the this week's show, I should say. On our next show, we'll see how the federal safety net for the nation's dairy farmers is not what it used to be. See how changes in federal farm policy are causing dairy farmers to have to depend less on federal subsidies. In the food factor, see what to keep in your refrigerator and what to keep on your counter. Oftentimes, cool is better. And in southern gardening, want to decorate your home naturally? Gary Bachman will have some ideas on using annuals in containers. And if you'd like further information on Farm Week Story, you want to suggest a story to us, you need to get in touch. That's Farm Week Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week.